Um, our next speaker is uh, Chris Dupree uh, from the NRAO. And uh, Chris, can you hear us? Uh, Chris is going to join us on Zoom as well, and uh, I'd just like to ask him whether he'd like to share his slides on Zoom um, or whether he would like us to share and he tells us to advance. Yeah, I, Chris, I can go ahead and start to share. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Chris. That'd be awesome. Yep. yep. Uh, let's see here. Nope. I don't think Recording I'm in progress. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. There we go. Are you seeing the right screen? Thank you, Chris. That looks really good. OK, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish I could uh, be there in person. Uh, and uh, But uh, I'm happy to, to be with all of you remotely. Uh, so my name is Chris Dupree. I'm the Deputy Spectrum Director for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And I just want to tell you about uh, some of the activities that the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has been engaged in. Um, I think this is a really important conference. Uh, glad to see all of us to start communicating about the things that we've been working on. And I'm going to be talking about strategies for spectrum coexistence uh, between radio telescopes and satellite networks. Uh, of course, we're starting with uh, our own radio telescopes and the satellite networks that uh, we have communications with right now. But we hope, of course, that this work can be expanded uh, as all of uh, as all of us move forward. Uh, so the Collaborators uh, on our end, uh, there are several people involved in this. Uh, Tony Beasley, uh, who's the director of NRAO, uh, our new uh, program administrator for the Quiet Zone, Sheldon Wasik, uh, Irvishi, Rob, uh, Will Armand Shroud at Green Bank, and Harvey List, and of course, uh, several collaborators uh, and engineers who we've been working with at SpaceX. And uh, this is the abstract from the conference. Uh, the one thing I just want to point out, and the reason I put this up here, is that uh, the <clears throat> discussions of mitigation plans for the NGVLA are, are a talk all in themselves. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to get into that today because of time limitations. So what I want to talk about today are uh, sort of three main areas. Uh, the first is talking about uh, a device called the Advanced Spectrum Monitor that NRAO has begun development on. Uh, this is work that's been funded by the National Radio Dynamic Zone Project that the National Science Foundation has funded. Uh, we deployed our first prototype back in uh, May of this year and have begun initial testing, and uh, also we're iterating on that design. I want to talk a little bit about coordinated testing that we've been doing at uh, several of our sites, in particular, uh, work that we've done uh, in monitoring the installation of some uh, Starlink user terminals that have been installed at the Alamo Reservation near the Very Large Array out in New Mexico, and, um, and also some studies in boresight avoidance that we've been doing uh, with Starlink, uh, both at the Green Bank Telescope and at the Very Large Array. And then finally conclude uh, with a little bit of a summary of a project that we call Operational Data Sharing. And uh, this is uh, an internal project for now that we hope can be generalized, but this is a real-time status coordination uh, of our systems with um, satellite constellations. So to begin with uh, ASM development, uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory has been working as uh, to develop <clears throat> various elements of the National Radio Dynamic Zone project. One of our biggest contributions uh, is the development of a spectrum monitoring device. And so our goal here is to produce a, 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 um, a cheap uh, spectrum monitoring unit that can be used both for radio observatories and for the National Radio Dynamic Zone. Uh, our eventual goal is for these devices to cover a fairly large frequency range from 1 to 120 gigahertz. Uh, our proof of concept device covered from one to 20 gigahertz. Our second device is gonna push that limit up to about 50 gigahertz, and we will continue pushing up to higher frequencies uh, as the device develops. And uh, this past spring, we actually did field testing and RFI testing of our device at Green Bank. You can sort of see the device in the background here. Looks a little bit like R2D2 uh, in the background uh, as we deployed it at the, at the Green Bank Observatory. The GBO is over here on the left in the background. We've also been uh, working hard on curricular development with a citizen science project, high school and undergraduate curriculum 
um, and these are all related to spectrum understanding. And then finally, uh, NRAO has been participating in the National Radio Dynamics Zone concept definitions. Uh, there are a couple of articles that have come out that we've participated in. One was in IEEE this past spring. Uh, a second was a more popular article uh, talking about how a National Radio Dynamics Zone could be used to address some of the issues that come up with uh, satellite interference. And then of course, like many institutions, uh, NRAO is participating in the NerdsCom conferences that have been organized by the National Science Foundation. And uh, there's a series of ongoing uh, workshops, coffee table events. Uh, uh, these are lean coffee table discussions that uh, NRAO is uh, participating in the leadership of. So real quickly, just some examples of the ASM development. Uh, over on the left is a scan of the spectrum from one to five gigahertz. This is just at the very low frequency end of what this device can cover. And uh, it shows the difference between uh, the spectrum we see when deployed at the Central Development Laboratory in uh, Charlottesville versus when we deploy the device up at Green Bank. And of course, we see the Wi-Fi bands here uh, and several other, whoops, sorry, and uh, several other uh, bits of interference. One of the depressing things, of course, is that even at Green Bank, there is RFI, right? Uh, it is not a quiet zone in any in any specific way, it is certainly quieter than other places. Uh, and over on the right is uh, the interface that we've been developing. Uh, this is the work of David Bordenave, uh, who's been working on the software development. And this covers uh, about four to four and a half gigahertz. And basically the spectrum is uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, and then time is uh, the time axis is over here on the right with the waterfall plot. And we see several examples of different types of interference uh, this covers the Wi-Fi bands. By the way, the uh, time is on the y-axis <clears throat> from top to bottom, and the colors are an indication of direction finding. This device has some uh, direction finding capabilities uh, that we are developing. Uh, we also spotted a cordless phone that was operating near the observatory down there at the bottom, which has a fairly characteristic uh, spectral signature. So the design is evolving. Uh, we have uh, a new enclosure that we're developing <clears throat> for ASM2. Um, it has separate cutouts and then of course radome covers so that this device will be uh, weatherproofed and able to be deployed. Um, there are cutouts for separate <clears throat> receivers that uh, will be um, placed inside the enclosure. Uh, actually, an evolution of this design has a hinge design where these things uh, swivel out and you can access all of those receivers. And uh, a new um, a new series of um, um, modules is being developed to cover bands uh, from 1 to 20 is uh, the first, which is tied to a sinuous antenna. And then we have other frequencies that cover uh, up to 50 gigahertz. So we've been doing a number of coordinated uh, tests with uh, SpaceX in particular. Of course, this is the satellite constellation that is deployed and active uh, with a large number of satellites. I believe it's over half of the current satellites orbiting uh, are uh, Starlink satellites. Um, we did uh, coordinated testing out of the VLA site when I started with NRAO back in 2021 and have been doing experiments uh, since. Uh, Starting in spring of 22, we did a pilot installation of user terminals at the Alamo Reservation. Um, that was completed in the summer of 2022. And then <clears throat> we've continued this testing uh, through this past summer. And uh, very recently, actually, NRAO has uh, and NSF have uh, shown their commitment to this work in uh, hiring a data analyst specifically uh, focused on RFI data analysis, both at the VLA and at Green Bank. Um, this is the work of a summer student this past summer who uh, looked at the Alamo pilot testing. So the Alamo reservation is located very close to the very large array, sort of to the northeast of the north arm in the A configuration. And um, one of the interesting things we've seen, of course, with an interferometer, you get the benefits uh, of the interferometric reduction in, in RFI, especially in your long baselines is that we wanted to sort of look at the effect of um, uh, of the, we wanted to look at the effect of the presence of this uh, RFI on uh, standard process data. And so 
up at the top, uh, what we show is a, a, a weak source. It's about half a Milijansky source. Uh, in the downlink bands, that's from 10.7 to 12.7 gigahertz, and in the uplink bands from 14 to 14 and a half gigahertz. One of the effects we noticed uh, in the very early testing back in 2021 is that uh, what we really need to be concerned about uh, is the downlinks. The uplinks really don't seem uh, to have a big effect uh, on our telescopes, um, even when they're located relatively closely. Um, and what we've shown is <clears throat> this is the first A configuration testing we did back in 2022. This is the A configuration testing uh, that we've done uh, this year back in uh, July. And this is a plotting of the uh, RMS uh, noise in images as the ones shown on the right. And we see that um, the, the change in the same configuration is that we, we see a, a fairly uh, level uh, noise level um, in, in these data over time in the same configuration. And we're continuing that monitoring uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, one thing that we did notice that I wanted to share with you, <clears throat> which was very interesting, is that we did a test with, um, with, with Starlink where we pointed the telescope uh, to the GBT to the north and just made one second scans uh, where we did a tip of the telescope uh, pointed to the northern uh, northern a horizon and we tipped down from about 75 to about 25 degrees and back up. And uh, randomly, without planning, uh, we saw a fairly large signal. Uh, when uh, we were looking at the data, this is a one second scan, and you can see from 11.4 to 11. Point, uh, well, 11.45 to 11.7 gigahertz, which is uh, downlink channel uh, five, I believe, four, <laughs> we saw this large signal of several thousand Janskys. And so um, in this test, we uh, actually hadn't you know, uh, predicted that we would see this. We started to do some analysis uh, of where this uh, satellite was located when this happened. And so we see here now, these are one second positions of a satellite close, uh, passing very close to Boresight with the GBT uh, beam map shown in the background. And so uh, clearly here, we passed very close to Boresight the figure on the right here uh, shows <clears throat> um, the telescope response uh, as a function of time. And actually the, the red level there is a one second um, uh, uh, running, running integration uh, of the side lobe level. So although we're below the peak response of the telescope, we can see why you would see this very large signal here. Um, we're continuing this testing. This is an example recently where uh, we've detected uh, channel one and channel two downlink uh, signals. And this Chris, is where we actually... Sorry, this is, this is your two-minute warning. Thank you. This is where we actually had a coordinated uh, test where uh, we actually were given an RA and DEC to point at, uh, knowing that we would have a close to Boresight passage. And this came within about a tenth of a degree. By the way, for the GBT passage, that came within uh, 0.05 degrees. So how can we uh, coexist? Uh, one possibility is this idea of operational data sharing. And this is where we share with uh, satellite networks what we're doing and work to uh, have uh, our, our telescopes avoid their signals. So this is uh, just a graphical overview. This is looking at the Green Bank uh, Observatory. Here's some satellites downlinking to various places on the Earth um, and uh, looking up at the sky that a satellite that is passing close to Boresight would be something we want to avoid. There are three possible ways that this could happen. Uh, one of which is uh, where we have radio zone monitoring. So this is uh, currently active in the US where um, the Starlink satellites do not directly illuminate the radio observatory site. One is called frequency multiplexing. Uh, and in this case, uh, we are broadcasting the frequencies that we're operating at and the satellites uh, choose different frequencies to operate at. And then the most recently, boresight avoidance, where we tell the satellites where we're pointed and the satellites that are crossing that position in the sky um, uh, operate differently. And they, they work to either change the frequency that they're downlinking at or where they place their beams on the surface of the Earth. 
So the idea of operator uh, operational uh, data sharing is that uh, we have our observatories and there's a real time system where SpaceX, OneWeb uh, and other possible satellite systems would then be aware of what we're doing and and um, change their operational mode so that we can avoid one another. Uh, and we hope that this system can be expanded. So to summarize, um, we all know there are a lot of challenges coming um, and we've got to explore, we've got to adapt. And I think one thing I've learned over the past couple of years is we have to communicate. Having open lines of communication with the satellite companies has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, we are trying to develop the means for spectrum monitoring devices in addition to using our telescopes and seeing the impacts of our telescopes. Um, we have had um, some important insights into how radio astronomy can adapt. Um, and you'll hear more about this, to, I think, next from Giorgio. Uh, Alma and other telescopes are developing strategies. And as we continue into the coming months, we are going to be testing. Uh, we're going to be testing uh, the operational data sharing in the coming months, where we'll provide uh, our real-time data system is already working at NRAO, and we're going to be working to um, see what sorts of uh, solutions we can come to where they avoid the position in the sky where we're pointing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we have time for one question, if it's a quick one. Yes, Federico. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Chris. Federico Di Bruno here. Great hey, presentation. Hi there. Uh, quick question. On the monitoring system that you're developing, are you considering providing that for, for other observatories? And if you are, what would be the cost you're looking at? Yeah. Um, uh, we are early in the development phase. We're hoping to keep the costs down uh, as much as possible. You know, in, in working with stakeholders, we've tried to make sure that we're building a device that will be useful. You know, one of the interesting things is that uh, direction finding capabilities is something that has, you know, been considered to be pretty important. Um, one thing that we are trying to do is build a device that will, you know, come in lower in cost than uh, you know, some of the commercial systems that are already out there. But our big advantage, I think, is that this device will push to higher frequencies uh, than are currently out there and hopefully provide direction finding uh, without having to own multiple devices, right? So a single device could be deployed at an observatory. Um, I, I can't really provide a, a good dollar figure right now. I think we're too early in the development for that. But I would certainly say that, you know, we want, uh, we can build a device that will be less expensive than commercial devices out there and will provide frequency coverage that doesn't exist yet. So we are trying to provide something new. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks again for the great talk. Thanks. Um, there are a couple more questions online on Slack, Chris. If you'd like to look into the Slack channel um, where it says hashtag place questions here, there are a few more questions for you. If you could answer them online, we'd be really appreciative of that. Thank you again.